Okay, we're continuing now with part six of the tutorial of War for America. We're in the early spring turn of 1777. And we'll begin with both players placing their magazines, the British first. Now the British this time have more magazines to place. They're allowed to put one magazine in each uh, region that has British strength points. So that's going to be Canada, New England, Middle States, and the Deep South. Let's place those now. Okay, in Canada, I think we'll place a magazine at Cataraqua. Yeah, Cataraqua. Now, in the New England states, there isn't a heck of a lot of choices, but it may look crazy, but I'm going to put one here at Northfield. There's a British garrison there, so I need a quarter strength point. And no doubt it'll be captured. But I've got my reasons for it. Since the British always have access to supply through the sea and they're at Newport, I don't think there's any danger really putting it there. And the Middle States, again, I have a few choices. Where could we put that? Well, someday they're going to be operating on the interior, but. Um, well, I'll go with, how's the way go? And down in the deep south, I think we'll place it here at Augusta. Okay, the Americans place their magazines. They'll be placing five because they have the bonus still. Um, no real problems putting them in New England. I suppose, well, let's put it up here at Norwich. In the Middle States, can't put it at New York. Albany could be squeezed, but I'm going to put it a little bit in the interior at Wyoming. Hard to get, but you never know where the Continental Army is going to end up. Down here in the Tidewater region. Well, we'll put it at Fort Cumberland in the interior. Down in the deep south, I think they'll put it with Charles Lee. And they have a bonus one, which they often put in Georgia. But we can't because Georgia is subjugated by the British right now. So they got, they're going to have two in the deep south. Again, a lot of these magazines seem superfluous, but uh, when you need them, they can come in handy. I'll put them here at uh, Guilford. And that's the magazine placement for both sides. Okay, we're going to take the 1777 year cards and fold them into the um, draw deck. I'll shuffle those. And I will not put in the discards. This way we'll try to get some more events put in. So I think unofficially I'm going to make that a rule. You don't uh, put in the discard cards until the uh, draw deck has uh, been totally expired or gone through. So we'll put the deck there. Now. Each side will draw cards to fill his hand to three. Now, British have one card, so they'll be drawing two. Let's draw a British card, they get a battle card. The Americans will draw a card, and they get Storms at Sea, which is a, a British or American event. That could be very important. And the British will draw their third card. This is the Jane McCree Massacre. And that's an American event. So, once again, they have to offer it to the American player. And the American player, I think, will take it and discard this battle card. That means the English will draw one more card. And they get a uh, composite event, Severe Winter. At least now we're seeing some uh, events come up. 
Now we check the transport capacity for 1777, it's still 10. You don't accumulate transport capacity, but it remains at 10. From this year onward, 1778, 1779, 1780, the transport capacity will go down. Now we didn't see a lot of movement by sea by the British, but later on, we probably will see a lot of British movement by sea. Okay, now we come to the phase that the Continentals like, and that's the raising of the new Continental Army. We're going to roll four times for each region, starting in New England, Middle States, Tidewater, and Deep South. And we have to watch for the appropriate modifiers in each case. Okay, we're rolling for the New England States, and we have to minus one from the dice because the colony of Rhode Island is under British control, so you minus one. The British player would like to see a low roll, the continental player would like to see a high roll. And he gets, ooh, the best for the British. So he rolls two to six, minus one is really a five. And you get four continentals in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, which must be split, and two in Connecticut. I'll place those now on the board. Now the priority places for raising continentals are key spaces. So we've got a few choices. Springfield, Boston. Uh, well, I think the best place would be to put them right into Washington's army in Boston. So I'll add two strength points to Washington's army, which now makes him a 10. The other colonies, uh, New Hampshire, and I think we'll add it to Portsmouth here, adjacent to Washington. Now, one technical difficulty you may have noticed in the uh, videos, I've certainly noticed it, is how the picture goes in and out of focus. Now, that's the function of the iPad itself. And the iPad is supposed to keep the picture in focus. Uh, it usually does when the target is motionless, but occasionally, for some reason, it just goes out of focus could be because the three-dimensional character of the, uh, uh, the counters themselves and the flat board, I don't know, but apologies for that. I really have no control over that. So we're now rolling for the Middle States. Now the British do not control anything in there, so it's going to be a straight die roll. And they roll a nine, which will give them a maximum so two Continentals in New York, two in New Jersey, and four in Pennsylvania. Okay, I'll put the two Continentals with Putnam at Albany. We're going to have two more Continentals at New Jersey. And Skyler's already there with the force, so I think we'll add them to Skyler's force. And we are allowed four at Philadelphia and, or rather, uh, Pennsylvania. Hmm. Well, the key centers are priority, so we'll raise four at Philadelphia. Overall, the Continentals are making good their losses in the wintertime. Okay, we're now going to roll for the Tidewater region. Tidewater. No modifiers there either. Whoa, 12. That's the best they can get. So, one Delaware, two Maryland, and four Virginia. Okay, the Delaware has to go at Wilmington. Two go in Maryland. Baltimore, oops, looks logical. And four in Virginia. Well, eventually we're going to have to send men south, so maybe it's best to put them in southern Virginia. Maybe Charlottesville here, four. So 1777, the Continentals did fairly well. They got a pretty good levy, and uh, the British are going to be dealing with large Continental armies. Of course, they have to be gathered, and in that task, the British may be able to take advantage of the fact that they're scattered. 
Okay, for leader promotions and demotions, Skyler is demoted. He was a three-star leader, now he's demoted to a two. However, Gates, who is in command of the Northern Army, was a two-star general, and now he's a three-star, which means he can now command and create an army, which is going to be handy. And General Ward, who's with Washington currently, is removed. So that's it for the um, early spring leaders. Now we'll look at the British. Okay, the good old Lord Dunmore is removed. Never to be seen again. Up with the Canada Army is Burgoyne, who's currently a two-star general, and he's promoted to three-star, which means he can now create an army in Canada. Remember, Carleton is still okay. He's still there uh, at Ticonderoga, but he can't go any further south. So Burgoyne will be the new army commander. And way over in the Europe box, Replacing Barry St. Leisure, Colonel Rodden, with three British, three Germans, and two Loyalists. They are coming from Europe. So with that set up, we're about set to roll for initiative and see who moves first in 1777. The historians often say 1777 was the decisive year of the revolution, uh, very likely because of Saratoga, and the announcing of the French alliance. In this game, it could be very decisive too. But let's see who goes first. The British go first in 1777. They will be taking the first action, Pulse. Kind of appropriate. Now, the British. I almost have to rethink their strategy because 1776 didn't turn out too well for them. Oh yes, they captured New York City, they've got a good block in Canada, and they still hold Newport, but they're not really gaining their objectives. Washington's army, reduced by the winter, is now currently at 10, so Howe could move against Washington, but he'll probably retreat. Very hard to bag Mr. Washington. So I'm not sure whether a northern strategy is the way to go right now. So I'll let the Reinforcements determine something. Maybe I'm going to have them go down to uh, the south. That would be Lord Rodden. I could have him go. Rodden is only a one star leader, though. So only two can really travel and move with him. That's not too good. But it's probably what I'm going to do. Now, coming from Europe. Rodden isn't restricted by the one or two strength points. He just comes in with all the reinforcements. So I'm going to have Rodden. The destination will be Charleston, South Carolina. So we're going to roll for Rodden to see how far he gets. Boy, the British are having very bad luck at sea. They go one. So Rodden and the boys are going to be in the Atlantic Ocean area number one. Contrary winds again. Destination Charleston. Barry St. Leisure, his destination is going to be Quebec. And he will roll. He gets a four. So he has no trouble landing at Quebec. Just one, two. When you land, you have one wooden point left. So St. Leisure will move to Trois Rivières. That's the British reinforcements done. And what are they going to do for their action pulse? Okay, about the only thing that's working for the British right now is this southern campaign. So I think they've got to go with that. That'll mean moving Clinton. Now, as the British move, they've got to screen Georgia so that Charles Lee here can't get back in and free it up. So Clinton's declared move will be moving directly on Charles Lee. Let's see if Clinton gets his initiative. He rolls a five. 
Clinton, I think, is a five. So Clinton does get his initiative. Clinton has a formidable force there, and um, another thing the British should consider at this time is, so far they have not tried to raise a single loyalist anywhere in any of the colonies. Now the British need help now, so maybe it's the time to expend a loyalist chit, which we will do. That can be done at any time, and it's free action. So we put a loyalist chit there to show us that we are going to roll for loyalists in the Deep South. Okay, the British must roll on this loyalist and militia muster chart to see how many they get following this guideline here, over here. So the most they could raise in the Deep South is six loyalists. That's not to be laughed at. Six strength points could be handy. Question is, how many do they get? We roll the die and see. They roll three, which is half the loyalists. So they get three loyalists in the Deep South. They're allowed to place them anywhere where there is not American SP. Let's see what's most advantageous for the British here. Okay, well, the most logical place to put these new um, loyalists would be at 96. And since Clinton is on the move, he could pick them up and hit Lee. So I think that's rather logical. Now, Clinton's going to have to leave a garrison behind. Um, I think he'll leave two British regulars behind. Remember, Clinton is not an army because he's only a two-star general. Okay, so Clinton is going to leave one garrison. It happens to be in a fort. And he's going to move with seven British regulars. And he can pick up those three. Remember, his maximum is ten. And go one, two, three, four. And land on Charles Lee at Sararo. Let's look at the odds. Okay, looking at the math, again, a fairly equal battle. The British would be on the 8 to 14 table, adding two to the dice. They have to take one off for the entrenchment that Lee has, so they'd actually be adding one. Lee would be on the 3 to 7 table, and adding two to the dice, Charles Lee himself and Morgan's tactical. Pretty even fight. Now, should the Americans fight? It's always better for them to withdraw, fight later. Sometimes you just want to fight. Now that's, um, hmm. That's the British move, so there's no point really in fighting, just try to withdraw. And uh, Clinton is just in command of Serraro. I'll let the dice decide. So Charles Lee will try to withdraw, and he must roll his initiative. So rolling, he gets a four, which is his initiative. So Charles Lee will fall back, and he'll fall back to Chira. Now Lee can destroy the magazine as he leaves, which he does, and he will, of course, lose the entrenchment. So, Charles Lee, along with the tactical leader Morgan, is now here at Chira, and Clinton is here. Kind of a fruitless victory. Again, you can sort of sense the frustration the British must have. Even when he wants to fight the colonials, the colonists don't have to fight. So these withdraw roles are very important. And that's the British pulse for that turn. Americans have three cards, and I think the Charles Gravier de Vergennes is a good card to use. He can add one strength point the Continentals to two different friendly spaces in the 13 colonies. So he can play that, which he will. And he's going to augment Charles Lee with at least one Continental. Beef that army up. And add one Continental to any other space. Well, why not Hillsborough? 
that'll give Clinton a run for his money. Now all that is free because that's a card. So what is Charles Lee's move now? He actually has enough to counterattack Clinton or try to get in his rear and free up the South. Let's look at the strategic options. I think the best move for Charles Lee would be to retreat, join up with the other militia and Continentals and make his army huge. Now we have another rule you have to watch out for again. Not complicated. He's allowed to bring this South Carolina militia or militia that's in South Carolina into North Carolina as long as he doesn't disobey the maximums, which is four militia in North Carolina. So he's quite legal to do so. And how big is that army? Right now it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So he hasn't exceeded his 10. Let's see how many moving points he gets. His destination is Hillsboro, where he will entrench. Roll the die. He does not get his initiative, which means he only gets two moving points. So he'll go to Fort Bernard, pick up the militia, and go to Hillsboro. And I'll consolidate that stack into something more appealing. There we have Charles Lee concentrated at Hillsboro. Five Continentals, four militia. A very respectable army. Now keep in mind that magic number of five. Because five Continentals, five regulars, is the magic number you need to score a major victory. But I don't think Charles Lee has much difficulty there. In order for Clinton to surround him, it would be nearly impossible. He'd have to just totally surround these places, fight him in a battle, win, cause him to retreat. That's just not going to happen, because he's got four avenues of retreat here. So Charles Lee is in a fairly secure position. And that's the Continental turn. We're going to roll now for the next initiative. The initiative, second initiative. And the Colonials go first. Now that's a bit of a twist. So, we know the Clint, or Lee has an army of nine. And here's Clinton with a ten. But why should the Continentals attack? You don't win the game by destroying strength points. That's when he means to an end. So. Lee is fine there. Maybe we should look at some other options for the colonels in the north. Let's take a closer look. Yes, looking at Gates' army, it's far too small. Notice it's only a strength of four. And to create an army, you have to have a strength of five. But if an army is reduced below five, you don't take it off the board. It's still viable in an army until it's destroyed. And we don't want Gates destroyed, so we better reinforce it. The most logical place here is Putnam. He's close by with three. I could pull out Thomas. He's an okay leader. Well, no, D. And then we've got three strength points there. Three points away. Putnam is only two away. So it would be madness to not move Putnam. So Putnam will roll for his initiative, which is four. He rolls. It's a two. So Putnam has no trouble going one, two and joining, and he's now joined with Gates's army. Gates's army is now five strength points. Gates right here at Fort Edward. Okay, it's now the British action phase. And as always, we should begin with the reinforcements that are at sea. The destination for that force was Charleston. So we're going to roll, see how many moving points they get. Six, yes, that's more than enough. So they'll go one, two, three, and land at Charleston, four. Now they have one moving point left, but hmm, I think we better just stay right there. 
and that's the British naval move that does not consume an action pulse. Okay, in the south, how is Clinton going to get this show on the road? Well, he could go for control of South Carolina. Actually, I just noticed now that uh, he has control of South Carolina. I was thinking that Wilmington is in South Carolina. It is not. It is in the north. So, actually, Clinton has control of South Carolina, which means we have to adjust the political markers. PW goes down one for the Colonials, and PW goes up one for the British. So, Clinton now has control of South Carolina. Now, the question is, can he hold it? Should he stay there and entrench, or get bold and go into North Carolina? Now, I don't know. He isn't entrenched yet, and Clinton's force is big enough, but he'd have to leave a garrison behind at Sararo, which is not good, and he's still not an army yet. So I've got decisions. Now, Rodden is on the coast, but we have really not enough leadership to get a lot of people moving. I'd have to roll a few times, no leader, which is always a very uncertain proposition. Let me think about this for a second, and let's see what Clinton can do. Okay. Clinton's got a good campaign going right now, and I don't want him to blow it. So I'm going to go by slow approaches. Now, Rodden, if I moved Rodden with two strength points to Wilmington, no doubt Lee would move on and probably crush him. So what I'm going to do is move a large force with no leader up to Wilmington, taking the direct route, Georgetown, Wilmington. Question is, how big will that force be? Okay, I'm going to leave Rodden on the coast with a mixed force of one British regular and one loyalist. But they are in a fort. So that will be the garrison of Charleston. And its disposable force, the movable force, is quite considerable. I really hate to be moving that kind of a force without a leader. Maybe Clinton can eventually link up with them. Okay, I rolled for that force. Okay, I rolled for that force, and they got a six, which is more than enough to march up to Wilmington. Again, I'm nervous about them moving without a leader. Now, check the rule. It's 11.8. Um, when you don't have a leader at all, your maximum combat factor is 10 which is still respectable enough in the south, but I don't recommend moving without leaders if you can help it. But in this situation, I just had to consolidate and try to hold on to South Carolina. So that's the British turn. Now the colonials have their move. Now Charles Lee would certainly like to do something about what's going on in the south, but they've got two pretty good British wings there, and maybe he'll just pull in some more reinforcements, although keeping in mind, he can still only move 10. But I think Charles Lee will you now, we'll have this force over to the left there. We'll have that four join Charles Lee as its action pulse. We'll roll, minusing two from the dice. They get one, which means they get one lousy movement point. So they get to Amherst. Again, a good reason why you want to have leadership. Actually, now that I think of it, I should have pulled Thomas. Well, yeah, let's say... I feel sorry for the Colonials here, even though they're winning. We'll say I activated Thomas. We put Thomas on the four, and he rolls for his... Uh, no, we've pulled Thomas. That means he uh, activates, of course. So Thomas merely joins Charles Lee. So now Charles Lee is a very respectable cut-out force at Hillsborough. So we're rolling now for the last action pulse of the early spring of 1777. And the British move first. 
last action pulse of the turn. Now, this going to now go for North Carolina control. Let's see what his options are. Well, he actually has enough movement points to run to the coast. One, two, three, four. Uh, wouldn't have enough. Well, I'm going to go this way. One, two, three, four, and land at uh, Fort Bernard, which wouldn't take control of the state, but it certainly would uh, make Lee cognizant of his power. He could pick up a lot of men there at Wilmington. Of course, he's got to leave a garrison at Serraro, too. So that's the big British dilemma, eh? Trying to hold on to territory, garrison it, and attack at the same time. Not an easy task. But I think Clinton's going to go for it. Um, Americans have been pretty good in their retreat for combat rules. Maybe one of them's going to fail. The trouble is, this force is now pretty respectable. Nine... 13 factors, Continentals too. Not good at all. Not good at all. Hmm. What's Clinton going to do? Once again, I'm not utilizing the largest British army on the board, which is the Royal Army and the big force at Newport. That's deadly. Got to get the Royal Army doing something. That's how here. Also, Cornwallis, he's an excellent leader. Adding three to the dice, he's not doing enough. Maybe a campaign with the Royal Army here this way will scare Mr. Washington. I just won't have to do it. Or do a naval transport move into the Middle States, open up a whole new front here. The Royal Army, consisting of 11, 15 factors. Do I abandon New York and move into the Middle States or march overland through these continentals? We'll get stronger and stronger as I advance. That's not a good option. Delaware is its own state. If I captured that, that would take out another colony. Wow, decisions. Yeah, okay, that's it. I'm going to have the Royal Army move south. The eventual destination is Wilmington. He's going to plow through these guys if he can. And he'll have to leave a garrison at New York. New York must be garrisoned by at least four strength points. So I'll do that. Of course, that means that Washington can go in there and maybe strike New York. We just can't do everything. You just can't. Unless I can have Cornwallis bother Mr. Washington. Cornwallis can carry 10 factors. He adds three to the dice. Washington is currently in command of 14. But we've got to do something. Got to. Wow. Yes, I've got to do something. And it's going to be Cornwallis. Cornwallis is going to move to New London, then directly on to Washington. Why is he going that route when he can go directly there? Well, if Washington retreats, he could retreat to New London and be in Cornwallis' rear. So he's going to advance from New London. Let's see if he activates, first of all. He's a pretty good commander. So I'm going to move on Washington with how many factors? I believe three is a garrison. Oh, I can only go with 10, can you? That's right. 10. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with 10 regulars. I'll just make some change there. Okay, Cornwallis is going to make a move. He's going to leave the rest of his troops at New London, March, or uh, Newport, rather. March to New London, then march on Washington directly. Let's see how many moving points he gets. He makes it. So, he's going to be moving with a 10. Now, do I want to bother leaving a 1 behind there? I'm going to need every factor I need. Battle. It's the same table. 7 to 10, 3 to 7, 8 to 14. 
Boy, I hate to leave garrisons behind. I've won. They can be just snatched up so easily. Well, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'll leave a one behind. And Cornwallis will move on Washington with nine factors. So we've got an important campaign happening up there near Boston. The question is, does Washington run? Well, let's do the math. Okay. Cornwallis would be on the 8 to 14 table, and he'd be adding three of the dice. There'd be a good prospect of at least dinging Mr. Washington for at least one. Washington would be on the 10 to 14 table, adding four to the dice. So he'd be on the same table, but adding four. So the odds are that Washington would win that battle. So I don't think Washington would retreat. I think he would accept battle under those conditions. So what the British are hoping for, of course, is just plain luck. Do they have a card? Yes, they do. So they're going to play a card, which means they're going to be adding five to the dice, which give them a slight advantage. So they're going to play that card. They're going to be adding five to the dice. And Mr. Washington will be adding four to the dice. So we'll roll that combat now. It's going to be a rather important one. The Battle at Boston. Here we go. Let you see the table there. Okay, Battle at Boston. Well, that's not too good. Okay, nine plus four. The Americans have rolled a 13, which is two two stars. The British have rolled a seven plus a five, which is a 12, which is also two two stars, which means Cornwallis did not win the battle. It was one big bloody exchange. Each of them are gonna lose uh, two strength points. So we'll take two off of the Cornwallis leaves Cornwallis as a seven. Mr. Washington loses two. He's going to lose one regular and one militia. So the Americans come ahead, certainly, in that fight. Cornwallis retreats back to New London. And unfortunately, he wears a B marker, which is not too good. That's the British turn. Now, the Colonials have a turn now. And if Washington is bold, not that bold, what I think he should do is now strike Cornwallis while he's got a D marker on it. That's the magic thing you wait for. Wait till the enemy's deed, attack him. If you defeat him, he loses another step. So the most logical move for Washington is to move directly on Cornwallis. See if Washington gets his initiative. Most of the time he does. Yes, he does. Washington moves on. Now, are you allowed to retreat before combat? You certainly are, even with a D marker. So the British are going to try to retreat before combat, and that's Cornwallis's initiative. And he gets it. So Cornwallis retreats before combat to New London. So that whole campaign was wasted. Now, Washington could keep moving, of course, but he doesn't relish attacking Newport now with all those strength points. But he does have two moving points left, which does mean he can even move on New Haven and on the Royal Army at New York. But I don't think he wants to do that. Now, Washington should always be cognizant of his retreat routes. And he doesn't have the best ones this time. If the British were to move up there and attack him or something, he could be cut off. So with two moving points left, I think he should maybe move up to Springfield here where there's even more men waiting for him. So he'll go one, two, and there. And that's the end of the entire turn for the um, early spring of 1777. Lots of movement that turn. With that move, I think I'll post this one and 
Maybe I'll go one more turn. Late spring of 1777. So we've got an interesting little campaign down here that I'd like to see how it uh, turns out myself. So I'll post this one, and once again, thank you for watching.